Welcome to MC3003, which is Dark Side of the Net. This is a pre-recording of the first lecture of the course. Um, uh, you'll have to excuse me because I've got a bit of a dreadful cold. Um, so I'm going to try and do this lecture. I might have to pause it at certain points to kind of blow my nose or other horrible things. Anyway, so the way in which we're going to run this course is it's a two and a half hour to three hour block every week. Uh, these will occur on Mondays at nine o'clock in the morning and Mondays at three o'clock in the afternoon and there'll be repeat sessions so don't come to both just come to the one you're assigned to this week we're going to kind of just be looking at a bit of an introduction to it looking at a few key ideas and key topics and i want to run through what you're going to be doing on the module so in this introductory section we're going to have a quick look at some of the information about the course uh, defining what we mean by the dark side of the net what we mean by the surface web what is the deep web and what is the dark net we're going to look at some of the course content and look at some of the assessment and if we have time which of course you will because i'm recording this in advance you can watch a video at the end and i'll set that up to running class so this bit will probably last about 45 minutes to an hour so typically on this course um, i do a bit of talking we do an activity a little bit more talking and so on like that these lectures are going to be of course slightly differently in which I'll skip out the activities but what I'd like you to do if you could is pause the video when I come to an activity and start it up again but fortunately this week we're not going to be doing any of that I'm just going to be talking for the first 40 odd minutes or maybe a bit less or maybe a bit more and then you watch the video I'll show you what the video is at the end so let's jump straight in um, now, of course, at the beginning of every course, what we like to try and do is explain to you what you're going to be doing on the course. Um, so these are what we term the learning outcomes. This is the things that you should be able to do once you've completed the course. And basically, if you can demonstrate to me in the assessment that you've met these criteria, then you pass the course. If you can't demonstrate this, then you can't have the credit for the course. So quickly go through these. The first one is, I want you to be able to identify and critically discuss key elements of criminality online, including some of the methods used in cybercrime. So I want you to be able to spot what is crime online and discuss it, not just discuss how they do it, but start bringing in some of the more theoretical aspects into that discussion. Secondly, I want you to be able to demonstrate an awareness of a variety of approaches to the study of criminality online. Now there's different perspectives that we're going to look at on this course of how we understand uh, crime online. Uh, we're going to look at what's called a cultural criminological perspective, more of which in a couple of weeks time, and various other perspectives such as the economic and possibly the environmental perspective. So I want you to be able to show me that you're aware that there's multiple ways of thinking about being online, doing online crime or not doing online crime, but thinking about online crime. Uh, finally, I want you to really critically discuss a range of topics related to hacking, spamming, copyright violations, phishing and other aspects of illegal or antisocial behaviour on time. So you're going to be able to look, take examples of online crime, of things that people do on the dark side of the net, and I want you to be able to critically examine them, look at them in quite a lot of detail. We will, of course, be covering lots of other areas. Uh, we're going to be discussing some technical aspects, some sociological aspects, and different things. Now, one thing is, you're not going to be learning how to hack on this course. I couldn't possibly begin to teach you how to hack. Not just because the course is not long enough, because I don't really know very much myself. I know a few little tricks, but I'm by no means a hacker or a cracker. I'm a sociologist that looks at online crime. And I look at the beliefs we have about online crime and how it's carried out. So we're not actually going to be doing any hacking on this course. I might show you occasional screen grabs from things, or I'll show you bits of examples of hacking and other bits of things that go on online, but we're not going to be doing any of the naughty stuff. So basically, the idea of this course is to familiarise you with information about the darknet and some of the academic research that goes on about it. It's a growing area. There's lots of people now studying the darknet and looking at it. So let's dive straight in. Um, the course content, so the aim of the course is twofold. To introduce you to some of the systems that make the darknet possible, we're going to be looking at a range of technical systems that allow people to engage in activity that if not that if not actually illegal verge on the boundaries of legality. And secondly, we're going to consider some of the specific practices and activities that occur on the darknet. 
And each week we'll do a lecture, followed by a seminar kind of things, or we might get mixed up, or we might do a bit of a lecture with some discussion or activity, and then back to the lecture. And we're hopefully going to be watching some videos. Certainly we're going to watch one today, but there'll be other ones that we're going to encounter across the course. There are a number of set texts on the Canvas page. Please try and look at least one of each for each week as we go along, and these will help you in your assignments. And I'm going to talk more about this later on in the course. They serve as the basis for the assignments, but you are expected to go much further. And the more you read around the topic, the more familiar you're going to get with some of the ideas that are presented here. The lectures serve as no more than a really crude introduction, but the readings will allow you to go much deeper into the issues. So when you come to do your assignments, uh, you will have to draw on some readings. Do not, at this level, simply describe what I talk about in the lecture. We're looking for a lot more at level six from you. We'll be covering the topic in, in the seminar. The seminars are designed to enable you to grasp the issue. If you want to look at an issue in any detail, say in preparation for your assignment, please do the reading. Have a look at it. The readings are a mixed bag. Some of them are academic texts, which tend to be quite dry. Some of them are journalistic texts. Some of them are videos and short clips. So have a look around. Uh, the best way to approach it really is to go in via the, more, the stuff that's closest to you. Find things that appeal to you, things that you can understand a little bit, start reading around it, following links, and then going into a more systematic engagement with some of the deeper, uh, more analytic texts. So the general course perspective, the topics under consideration from the course have been studied from lots of different perspectives. That picture on you can see on the screen is my trying to get this. So we're looking at so like the topic of cybercrime here, but we're looking at it from a sociological perspective, a bit of psychology here, maybe some media analysis coming in here, uh, maybe some forensic criminology or psychology coming in here, and maybe our economics from another direction. So cybercrime is our field of study, but there's lots of different ways in which you can examine it. Now the main way in which people approach this stuff is from a technical perspective how to prevent against it. And most of the uh, courses you can study on dark side of the net, on, sorry, not on, on, on the dark net, or on online criminology, come from that, how do we prevent it? How do we do it? Here we're going to be a bit more nuanced, and amongst others, we're going to draw upon a perspective called cultural criminology, which you may have heard of, we may not, but it's a fascinating perspective. <coughs> now the aim of, well the, the central idea of cultural criminology is that crime is socially constructed. There are a few crimes that seem to be sort of like illegal no matter which society you go to. For example, the idea of murdering someone, killing someone, most societies would say that's bad. Incest, most societies uh, rule out against it. But pretty much virtually every other crime that you can think of at some other time and in some other society it's been okay to do that. And even murder. Well, it depends on how you define murder. If it's simply killing someone, well, lots of countries in the world still use the death penalty. It's legal to kill someone in an act of war. And even in domestic settings, it's still okay to kill someone, depending on who you are. A police officer can legitimately kill someone if they believe they're acting in a crime. So the sheer killing of them uh, might be constructed as murder in some societies, or justifiable homicide, or execution. But the act is you've taken someone's life away. It's the cultural construction of that action which changes it. Similarly, incest is not a very easy topic to think about, but certainly you can go to societies where incest has been legitimate. You can go to ancient Egypt, where you would find pharaohs marrying uh, their own relatives to keep the bloodline pure. You could even make that assertion about certain royal families in the 20th century in, in, across Europe. So the idea of incest is, again, uh, something that's socially constructed. So what a crime is in one country, an action or a you know, performance of a particular crime or performance of a particular action in one country or society may not be a crime in another one. Actions can be interpreted differently. A second big thing is we don't actually believe in the idea of criminals. Uh, there are some people who are criminals. And now in the Victorian ages, they believed you could detect a criminal maybe by uh, a strange science called phrenology, which was the shapes of people's heads. 
and they say if someone has a shape of a head in a particular way with lumps I've got quite a lumpy head but some people have lumps on the head and you could read their heads and touch their heads and oh yes that person's going to be a criminal so there's this category of criminal of bad person people who do things who are you know it's bad now people do do things they may be very nasty and unpleasant but they're not predisposed to break the law the law here is different to somewhere else and it, thinking about that first point if you go back and you think well someone that is a violent criminal if they're in particular situations in certain armies they will be awarded medals you take them out and you put them in a different situation those same actions suddenly turn that person into a criminal the law in different places causes us to look at crime to look at actions and to label some of those actions criminal so there aren't really people who are criminals who just go around breaking the law they might be very unpleasant people but people just do actions it's the law on top of them added to that action that turns those actions into criminal actions so instead of all that we assert that there is deviant behavior some people do engage in behavior that is not socially acceptable within wider local society and by local I mean the kind of values and norms that you've got in your society the law may come along afterwards and decide that those particular actions are actually so bad we make a law about them some actions however although unacceptable in wider society may be acceptable in smaller subcultures and there's of all sorts of actions you can think about that you wouldn't possibly admit to you know like to a, a police officer but maybe okay in your circle of friends so when we look at these actions you, we need really to think about them from this cultural chronological perspective but alongside an economic perspective a political perspective and a psychological perspective so as I said we're really interested in what we call a cultural criminological approach the cultural criminology believes that things are socially constructed Social construction means that it's ad, us adding meaning to an action. It has no intrinsic meaning itself. So, what are we studying? Well, we're looking at the activities that take place through digital media that many in society would consider deviant. Now, at the moment, some of these are illegal. Some of it was not illegal in the past, and it's only when the government passes laws that they say this action is now illegal it becomes illegal some things that were illegal in the past are now legal and uh, some things that you used to not be able to do not just online but in general so society have now become legal and we decriminalize them there are some things that are legal here but not elsewhere and there's some things that are illegal elsewhere but not here so what I, the idea here is that law and order and the idea of the criminal are local ideas to us there's something that we think about, we create in our society. Now we may also consider what it is about these things that makes them exist. We might look to the social conditions. What causes people to behave in a way that we now consider illegal? So those are the social conditions that produce criminal action. However, we are here are primarily interested in stuff that happens on the dark net. So, what we really need to do is try and define what we mean by the dark net. The dark net is something beyond the normal web. Um, so you're all familiar with the internet, Google and Facebook and things like that, and the website for yourself and the BBC news pages and the Daily Mail pages and the Guardian web pages and all the information we get from there. Now as well as that surface web, which is stuff which is easily findable, there's also something called the deep web, which is something slightly different. And to grasp the difference between the three, we need to really understand how normal search engines work and where they get their information. So the idea of the dark net really relates to the availability of information and how we can find that information. So I'll give you a quick overview of how search engines work. And they, they are a piece of technology that is being refined. They're about, well, they're about 25 years old now, search engines. So a search engine consists of three main components, a web crawler, an indexer, and a searcher. So a web crawler is a small program that 
goes out from your computer or from the um, search engine's computer and crawls around the internet. It copies itself from one computer to another, looking at web pages. It goes from web page to web page. It reads a file on the web page, um, which we can't see with a normal thing, but you can actually, if you know what to type, you can find this information yourself. This file is called a robots. These little web crawlers are called robots. They, they collect, they're self-propelled pieces of software that climb around the internet. Now, what that does, the web crawler looks at the information in the robot text file, and it sends information about the web pages and sites back to the search engine. Now, back at the search engine, there's a program called an indexer. And this is a database of results of the web crawler. Um, words are linked to web pages and it creates giant lists of pages associated with words and phrases. And then when you type in those words, it finds the web pages that are linked to them. And finally, you've got the searcher, which looks through the list and ranking of the pages. Now, say you, you pick a typical word, I don't know, it might be, let's have a think, sociology or media studies. And you don't just get a random sample on there, when you type those words into different search engines, you'll get slightly different results. And that's due to how those web pages rank the results. Which one do they put to the top of the list? If you type in a word into Google, you'll get maybe 15 or 20,000 different responses. But why does it put certain words, or certain pages at the top of the list and certain pages at the bottom of the list? Well, that's the result of um, web ranking. And that's a very complex science, and that's what makes some um, web pages or some search engines very good. So Google's got a particularly clever one. So how web pages are ranked, it's the unique selling proposition of different search engines. Now the first approach was to look at the number of hits, how many times a web page had been visited by other people. And that was what was kept going, and so web pages were very keen to get more people to look at their web pages, and that would gradually rise them up the list of uh, the web ranking, and then as they rose up the list, they get even more. So it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, the founders of Google came up with a new idea, and their big innovation was to rank them according to the number of links to them from other pages. So rather than just the number of people who clicked on the website, they want to look a more in-depth thing. So they're looking at how many people have actually bothered to copy a link from that website to another website. So becomes kind of like a, a citation index. In academia, the, uh, we know an article or a book is considered more important because of the more references to it from other texts. And Google used that idea, the more links to a page from other pages, the higher that page will appear in the web ranking. Now, newer subscriptions make use of a slightly different economy, it's not called the like economy, which draws on social media. So when you click like, on a page, Google now counts those as well, and also subscriptions to particular web pages that you follow. So all these factors, the number of people linked to it, of course still the number of times it's been clicked, the number of times people liked it, allow Google to order things in a great big ranking of systems. However, there's lots of things search engines do not see. So search engines only see what is in the static pages. And by static pages, I mean a fixed web page that someone has gone to the trouble of designing and putting up. And in the past few years, an increasing number of web pages are created on the fly or dynamically by a database. So if you think, uh, when you go to the university's library and you type in a word, it doesn't link you to a direct web page. What it does, it links you to a blank web page and then the library catalogue populates that web page with information from its database. So these web pages only appear once. They're created, they've got a rather mad code at the top, and they're created on the fly, and they don't exist for very long. Those web pages wouldn't be searchable by a normal search engine. They couldn't link to it because they only exist for the purpose of your particular search. So they only exist for length of the search. They're not pages in a normal sense, and therefore they don't get crawled and an increasing number of pages are like this. Whenever you do a search on Google, the actual list of pages, that, that, that page you're looking at with all the things on there, that's created dynamically for you. That wasn't something in existence before you typed in the words into the search box. 
Now, in addition to dynamically created web pages, there's lots of files and documents that can't be searched by crawlers. There's lots of video files out there, lots of text files out there, lots of PDFs and all sorts of things. These can't be understood by the crawlers. And so therefore, in many instances, they're missed. So that's the deep web. It's things that you don't find with a normal search engine. So how much is there of a deep web? Well, it's quite a lot. Current, and current estimates say that only about 4% of the web is actually searchable. The other 96% is made up of documents, of web, you know, dynamically created things, of video files, of images that aren't searchable. So look at, if you look at this appalling picture, which isn't very good actually, because the bottom half is no way 96% compared to the top. But it does give you an idea. So there is more than about 20 times the size of the visible web out there that we don't see with a normal search engine and isn't searchable using the usual tools. Now part of the job of academia is to try to give you some of the tools to go and search them. So we use the library catalogue to find particular things and we've introduced you to other tools over your time here. But there's still vast amounts of information out there that you can't achieve. Get out so. Now of that vast amount of data that we can't see, there's another strata. This is not the dark net, that big bit. The deep web can be found. We can't see it as a problem with search engines and the technologies used to create pages. It's not trying to hide, it's just that we're not looking very well. We haven't got a bright enough torch to find this information. It is open to us. No one's trying to hide that information. There is, however, a further subsection, a, a different, you know, a new basement below this lot of the deep web that does try to remain hidden. And that bit is what we're calling the dark net or dark web. It's information that people are hiding on the internet. So just to recap, you've got the normal searchable spit of the, all the information on the internet. There's about 4% up there. You've got about 96, 97, 95% of the other information, which is there, but we just don't know how to find it. It's not trying to hide. We just haven't got the tools to get to it. If you do have the tools to get to it, you can find it. But there's also another bit right at the bottom, which is trying to hide. Right, so when we talk about the dark net or the dark web, well, what are we talking about? Are they different things? Well, no, essentially they're the same thing. The web is just what you can see using a browser. Um, it's what that bit you can see when, you, when it says HTTPS slash slash www. That's a web browser and it's got an address so you can find it. The net is slightly bigger than the web because technically speaking you can't really watch certain files on the web. You can't look at databases using a browser unless there's a front end there. And there's other bits and bobs you can't see. So there's a lot on the internet that is not web stuff. Though we can use a browser to see it, it often wasn't designed for a browser. The dark web is not wrong, it's just that there is more than just web pages on the dark net. So the dark net is a more technically accurate description of what we're looking at. Okay, so the dark net, it cannot be visited with a normal browser. You can't just use an Internet Explorer or Chrome to look at the dark web. Um, there might be a few exceptions to this, but normally, they, and they might advertise on the normal web, but for the most part, you can't do it. Instead, you need to install a specialist piece of software called Tor, or the Onion Router, that's what the TOR stands for. <coughs> this is a specific browser that is designed to hide you from prying eyes and allows you to visit sites that do not want to be found by people using normal browsers. Uh, we're going to do a lecture on Tor in a few weeks' time to kind of introduce you to how it works. But basically, it was a system designed by the US military, US naval laboratories, to allow people to hide their web experiences. So if they were living in a country where the government is very restrictive, they, the US Navy produced this browser so they could go onto the internet and use the internet without their traffic being followed without people being able to see what they were doing and read their emails. There's also something called VPNs or virtual private networks. And these are uh, encrypted pathways between two points on the internet that allow traffic to be sent from one point to another point, but no one else is able to read that. Now when we go on to talking about Tor and a few other systems, this will make a bit more sense. 
But VPNs and Tor are the main ways in which you can look at this stuff. Now the main reasons for this are, uh, the main reasons people use these things are, well people are scared of being spied upon. And here we're talking about journalists and civil activists in various regimes around the world where the government is very powerful and uh, they're against the various civil liberties that these people want to achieve. The second is, people resent the idea that somebody could spy on them. They don't like the idea that every time you send an email, somebody could intercept your email and read it. Somebody could look at what you're browsing and work out patterns of behaviour from it. Someone could look at all your private messages that are sent across the internet. The third reason is, well, you might be doing something naughty. You might be doing something that's actually illegal. So there's the three main reasons is people are either scared or being spied on by the government, people are resentful, and when we talk about hacking, you're, this idea that somebody can look at your information, uh, for some people causes them to get very annoyed, and so they develop systems to do that. And finally, as the other group, people are doing things that might be considered by our society either illegal or antisocial. So where is this document? Well, it's not separate from the normal net. Instead, it's an application that sits on top of the normal net. So if you think of the internet as a, as a big kind of network of computers, one computer talks to another, the dark net isn't somewhere else. Instead, it's bits of software that sit upon these computers and channel the information around. It uses the same pathway and data transfer technologies, but it uses encryption. It takes this information and encodes it, so people cannot look at it, people cannot eavesdrop on this information. Now, because of encryption is key to the darknet, as it stops people from observing what you're doing. And again, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a lecture on how encryption works. And it is a huge topic. We can't possibly do it justice on a course like this. But I just want to introduce you to a few of the key ideas. So what the darknet is not, there's lots of unpleasant things on the surface web. Um, if you go on YouTube, you will find beheading videos. You will be able to look up things from ISIS and horrible things like this. There's uh, grooming going on on Facebook. There's people seeking to um, you know, pederasts and pedophiles on Facebook trying to contact children. There's lots of porn sites on the normal website of various flavors. You can possibly find anything you want on the normal web. There's lots of homophobic and racist websites. And there's illegally copied and distributed digital content available on web-based services. This is not really what we're interested in on this course. Instead, we want to look at the hidden, non-searchable stuff. We want to look at that strata of web content and net content that cannot be, find, cannot be found through normal means. And we're going to look at the culture and facilitating technologies that allow the dark net to function. So that's the main emphasis of this course. Well, what goes on on the dark net? Lots of stuff. Some of it's legal on the bug board, and some of it's and no different from normal web stuff, except it's private. Some of it not so. Um, so there's lots of sharing of files and information. People pass information around a lot. There's lots of trading and selling of information, goods and services. And this is done through non-standard forms of banking. People don't use the usual, you know, transfer the money into my NatWest account. Um, instead, they use a system called Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. Um, and again, this is another topic that we're going to be covering later on in the course to give you a kind of introduction. There's also lots of communication between people of similar interests. So you'll find communities forming of people interested in certain things, and it might quite might be quite esoteric pieces of information, quite esoteric topics, it might be political movements, it might be all sorts of things. But the dark is a good place where people can get together without fear of being ridiculed or pursued for legal reasons for their particular interests. To give you an idea, here is a uh, dark net. Let me just talk you through this one a little bit. If I can get my mouse okay. I hope you can see this. So this is using Tor. Okay, you can see the words Tor browser up there. This is the address very different from a normal web address. You can tell it's Tor because the suffix at the end says onion. If you remember Tor stands for the onion router. So it's an onion site. Um, I'll explain why onion 
is, is used in a few weeks time but basically it's a, it's a number of steps of security that it goes through so it's weird address here so you'd have to type it in exactly perfect like that and then mark it base. and what do you find well you can buy crack cocaine here you can buy cocaine here you can buy crystal meth you can buy I don't even know what that is oh fish scale cocaine um, what have we got? crack amphetamine counterfeit money I don't know what that is and I have no idea what that is either but this is a marketplace on the dark side and on the dark net where you can buy things that would be illegal and you wouldn't be able to buy in a normal shop and you would pay for these in Bitcoin uh, transferring it from US dollars into that so this is a, one of the websites that you'll be able to find on the dark net you also get other things now there's a dispute about how actual genuine this actually is but this is an assassination website. This poor gentleman called Ben Shalom Benaki. Uh, he was an American economist and he was chairman of the Federal Reserve. And someone took out a contract on his life. And if he was to die at a certain time, then the person who was who killed him would be paid uh, this amount of money, 124 um, Bitcoin. And I think Bitcoin is currently about $4,000 per Bitcoin. So that's quite a lot of money actually there and that's the um, uh, Bitcoin address to which he will be paid. Okay, then you've also got things like this. It's just a Sicilian hitman. So people advertise uh, a proven murder network. So whereas this one was somebody wants this guy killed and they put this website up there. This one, if you want someone killed, you can just go to these guys and you can send them the details, you log in and you, you communicate with them via the darknet and allegedly you can have someone killed. The whole thing is, uh, there's a lot of scepticism about this and no one's really sure if this is actually true or not because no one would possibly admit paying for somebody else to be killed because that would be illegal. So if it does go on, this is the kind of place where you can do it. Okay, so who uses the darknet? Well, basically anyone who is a wary of corporate or government surveillance and this might include journalists and political activists who may be surveilled by government forces it also may include terrorists using the dark net to communicate with each other or it might be someone who's trading in something deemed illegal it might be narcotics it might be weapons it might be hacking software a lot of that gets traded on the dark net it might be pornography legal or illegal it may be uh, data they don't have rights to identity theft uh, can be passed on and sold and you also might be to buy illegal services. You might be to buy fake IDs to be made up with your thing, with your photograph on it. You might be to buy various naughty services. You can buy for money for pay for pe people being beaten up, and so on. So there's lots of things you can do on the dark net. None of which I advocate. Now, in addition to the actual dark net, uh, we're also going to be looking at some of the activities that are facilitated by the dark net or facilitate the darknet so cryptography bitcoin and similar technologies we are going to be looking at hacking which is the practice of illegally using and penetrating other people's personal computers uh, we're going to be looking at the idea of spam which seems a bit of an odd topic because it seems so harmless but very annoying so these are the sending of unsolicited emails and we're going to be kind of looking at the ecosystem of hacking spam and organized crime so I'll give you a rough view, that's where we're at at the moment. Uh, next we're going to return to cryptography, how does it work? Then we're going on to Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies and the blockchain. Then we're going on to the Daniel Router. We're going to look at forums and four of hacking, how people trade online, how do they make connections and what they do. Uh, then we're going to look at two weeks on hacking. So the first week we're going to look at the history, the basic practices and some widely used techniques to watch out for. And then I'm going to try and theorise hacking. How do we understand hacking from a more theoretical perspective? We're going to turn to spam in week eight, where we look at what is it and how does it work, and it's quite complicated actually. Now we're going to be looking at organised crime and the economy of spam, and then I've got three weeks of tutorials about the assessment, which I'll explain in just a moment. So, <coughs> the assessment for this module is a portfolio, and that superficially it looks quite light because what I want you to do is to produce a three to five minute by five minute I mean that's the outside edge of it video in which you explore one of the issues covered on the course in negotiation with me 
So you come and have a chat with me and say, I'm really interested in looking at this particular topic. And I say, okay, here's some books, go and have a read about it, and you do some investigation. So you go away and you research the topic, you dig it into it, you start developing some critical uh, engagement with it, you read contradictory bits on it, and you get your information. And then you produce a short three to five minute video about that topic. Now, I'm not particularly interested in the quality of the video. Uh, that's not really what we're marking on this course. I'm marking your intellectual understanding, how you communicate, the, or you know, how you demonstrate and you understand this topic. Okay, it's got to be understandable though. I can't. You can't just send me a blank screen and some words that I can't hear. And the more if you put into it, the more communicative it is. It's not going to affect the mark very much, but it makes me easier for me to actually watch it. So if you think about it. Um, if, if you're like doing an essay and you didn't write it in very good English, it'd be hard for me to give you marks. If you make a bad video, it's going to be hard for me to watch it. So the video should be of an acceptable and watchable standard, but I'm not marking your technical competence in there. I'm also not specifying a genre. You could do it like a news broadcast. And if you think of a, a small news package that you get on one of the main quality news channels, the reports are usually no more than two or three minutes and they get a very, very you know, good level of understanding and you're able to understand a lot from that particular thing. Or you could make a short YouTube video style of thing, you could make a short animation, it's up to you. I'm not gonna specify that. Uh, choose something that will allow you to demonstrate your knowledge and it shouldn't get in the way of you demonstrating your knowledge. If you're finding the genre of your video is becoming more problematic for you, you've chosen the wrong genre. Finally, please upload the video directly to Canvas using a suitable format, either MOV, MP4, AVI or WMV. Um, try and keep it fairly small, no 10 gigabyte files, please. Uh, and come and see me in week 10, or before, please do come and see me before, to discuss your topic. So from week 10, I'll show you what I mean by here. So from week 10, we're gonna have tutorials. So I need you to see, you. everybody's gonna have to have an idea by week 10, and then the yeah, class time, you're going to come and see me and explain your idea if you haven't come to see me beforehand and I'll give you approval. You're not to pursue any ideas without me giving approval. This is partly for your safety and partly to make sure that we're looking at something that's actually worth looking at and related to the course. In week 11 we're going to do ideas development, you come and talk to me, explain how is it going, what you're doing and finally we can get some video support in week 12. So that's part one. Part two, as well as that three to five minute video, which you've dug into it, I want an annotated bibliography of items that you used in your video. What books, what uh, films, what newspaper articles, what journal articles, what book chapters did you consult to get the ideas for it? And what I want you to do is you write a bibliography, but then you put a short annotation on each one, just basically explaining what that article was about. So this should comprise of your book, journal articles and stuff, and it should be done in Harvard style, and it should be at least 10 items. So for each one, just give me a bit of a breakdown about what that is. So it might be, uh, if you pick the topic, say Misha Glenny wrote a very good book on the topic of cybercrime. And you say, it's a, you know, you would say something along the lines of, uh, it's not a peer reviewed article, but it contains lots of information about cybercrime and da 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 da. Okay. If it's a peer-reviewed article, you say it's a peer-reviewed article, it focuses on this topic, this topic, this topic. So put about 40 to 50 words under each item of your bibliography explaining what the article is about and if it's been any use to you. Okay, well the submission date for both is the 5th of April 2019 at 12 o'clock. That's midday, not midnight. Okay. Now, what I'm doing now is when it's class time and I'm not sitting here in my office doing this on Friday afternoon, there's going to be a video which you're going to watch, but you can go and have a look at that. I don't think you're going to be able to watch it off campus, or if you do, you'll have to log in to use it. It's I've found it using uh, Bob, the box broadcasting. So have a look at that. Okay, well, thank you very much. I hope that's been of use to you.